Nazis were the National Socialist Party, just like the Democrats are now a National Socialist Party. Calls those who oppose him vermin. He talks about the blood of America as being poisoned. Echoing the same exact language used in Nazi Germany. Wait a minute. Fascism has actually always been a phenomenon of the left. Now, I grew up in Austria. I'm very aware of Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. It was a night of rampage against the Jews carried out in 1938 by the Nazi equivalent of the Proud Boys. Wednesday was the Day of Broken Glass right here in the United States. What, do you really think Hitler was a leftist socialist? Yes! Yes, absolutely! It seems that these days everyone is called a Nazi. But what if the people calling each other Nazis are on the opposite side of the political spectrum? Surely they can't both be Nazis, right? So how do we find out who the real Nazi is? So the first thing we need to do is define what it means to be a Nazi. Nazi is an acronym for National Socialist German Workers' Party. Hitler uh, was, uh, was left-wing in that he believed uh, in socialism. Remember, Nazism is national socialism. Very few people know that, especially if you go to college where you don't learn much. But that is what Nazism stands for, national socialism. And if you are a conservative, the inclusion of socialist in their name is enough to define the Nazis as left wing. We have to remember that Nazis were national socialists. It's a strain of socialism. So let's not, let's not pretend it's, it's a left wing ideology. The inclusion of socialists in their name could only mean that they are left wing commies. But this is simplistic, if not naive and uneducated. Before the addition of socialists, the Nazis were known as the German Workers' Party and were positioned as a far-right group that openly opposed communism and socialism. In fact, the Nazis' definition of socialist didn't even apply to economics. It was part of the ethnostate culture known as the Volksgemeinschaft. It translates roughly to people's ethnic community. This is the dream of the Nazis that was to become their racially pure utopia. It excluded socialists, communists, social democrats, and trade union members as they were some of the first people removed from positions of influence and placed into concentration camps. These are the people that represented what we call the left today, and they were the political opposition that stood in the Nazis' way. The left were the first target of the Nazis because they represented the biggest threat to right-wing totalitarianism. With them out of the way, they could enact their plans to exclude Jews, gypsies, and anyone they deemed deviant like homosexuals and trans people. Nazi ideology was, and always has been, defined by its pursuit of racial purity, not its economics, which is much harder to define. The economics of Nazi Germany were inconsistent, as they were viewed as secondary to the goals of achieving a utopian ethnostate. During Nazi rule, the German economy was a means to an end. Hitler stated in Mein Kampf that, the state is not an assembly of commercial parties in a certain prescribed space for the fulfillment of economic task, but the organization of a community of physically and mentally equal human beings for the better possibility of the furtherance of their species, as well as for the fulfillment of the goal of their existence assigned to them by providence. This, and nothing else, is the purpose and the meaning of a state. Economy is, therefore, only one of many auxiliary means necessary for reaching this goal. But it is never the cause or the purpose of a state. Germany needed to become free from all its petrol imports as quickly as possible. Enormous public investment sped up the program of the production of synthetic fuel. But autarky had its price. One ton of steel from Goering's factories was three times more expensive than one ton of imported steel from Romania or the Soviet Union. The difference was paid by the state who handed out staggering subsidies. Nothing was spared for autonomy. From a strictly economic point of view, autarky was not a rational decision. The Nazi economy closed in on itself in order to prepare for war. 
On the economic level, war had already been declared. They're not unrealistic enough to imagine that Germany can ever really be self-sufficient. The aim of the game is to harden Germany for the war that is to come, is to make it more resilient than it had been in World War I. This is, of course, at the same time that the, the Nazi regime escalates foreign policy tension. There is the Anschluss with Austria early in 1938, and then the very deliberate push to dismember Czechoslovakia by way of Sudetenland. Hitler believed the economy served the needs of the Republic, and the goals of the Republic were imperialistic expansion and racial purity. When Nazi economic policy is viewed through this lens, it becomes much clearer why there was so little structure and consistency. Economic policies were afterthoughts that were often short-sighted and their only aim was to further the utopian dreams of a racist dictator. They were generally favorable to the wealthy capitalists, as the Nazi party would not have been able to take control of Germany if it weren't for their support. In 1932, the Nazi party was deeply in debt, and they were financially backed by leaders from the banking, insurance, textiles, chemical, and steel industries. In a private meeting, Hitler would tell the industrialists that private enterprise cannot be maintained in the age of democracy and backing the Nazis would in effect be supporting themselves. The industrialists were distrustful of the regime's social dimension. But they were soon reassured that Hitler wasn't a pinko. Rearmament guaranteed growth and the MIFOs piled up in the coffers. Dachau and Oranienburg were the first camps to open on March 20th, 1933 and the first political prisoners were locked up there the following day. For the leading German industrialists, the arrival in power of the Nazis was a safeguard against the communist threat. It's fair to say that indoctrination started in 1933-34. The strongest measure was the outlying of trade unions in May 1933. Then specifically in factories, the Führer principle was introduced. The leadership principle was one of command by and obedience to the boss, with a very clear sense of hierarchy within the factories. This meant that the employer's authority took precedence over the corporate councils, which had been one of the social advances of the Weimar Republic. With the support of the wealthy capitalists, Hitler called for national elections to be held in March of 1933. But before they took place, the Nazis would set fire to the Reichstag and blame it on communists in an attempt to turn public opinion against them. The Communist Party was a powerful opponent that had very strong support in Germany, and Hitler needed to eliminate them to accomplish his goals of winning what he called the last election. With goals of a dictatorship, Hitler knew that his biggest threat came from the political left, and that is why he started with them. This served as the lead into the Enabling Act, which marked the beginning of the Nazi dictatorship. The domestic policies of the Nazis were known for attacking academia and trying to undermine the education system. Nazi legislation targeted the universities, and they started their attacks with the most liberal, Frankfurt University. The Nazis appointed a new commissar and he immediately called a faculty meeting in which he announced that all Jews were forbidden from the campus. Following this announcement, he delivered an abusive tirade threatening the remaining faculty with concentration camps if they didn't comply with the new standards. With control over Frankfurt University, they set their sights on the rest of the education system. Book burnings were celebrated and the media was tightly controlled something Florida and other Republican legislators have tried to replicate. The LGBTQ community were criminals under Section 13 of the German Criminal Code, which regulated crimes and offenses against morality. Paragraph 175 applied directly to gay men, and they were placed in concentration camps if discovered. LGBTQ organizations were shut down and effectively ostracized from society. Based on anti-homosexuality laws that precede the Nazi era, thousands of homosexual and transgender people will be arrested and thrown into concentration camps during Adolf Hitler's dictatorship. 
for their sexual orientation and gender identities. Many of them will have to endure immense suffering and pay the ultimate price. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the nature of human sexuality became an important area of scientific investigation and debate. Germany was at the forefront of this development, not least because of debates regarding Paragraph 175, which from 1871 banned sexual relations between men. Even though there were groups who supported the decriminalization of sexual relations between men, such as the large moderate left Social Democratic Party or the more radical Communist Party, there were also groups who advocated for making this statute stricter. Among them were mainstream religious organizations, as well as various moderate and right-wing political parties, such as the radically right-wing Nazi Party, which officially opposed any efforts to decriminalize sexual relations between men. Wilhelm Frick, a Nazi member of the Reichstag, the Parliament of Nazi Germany, stated in 1927 that men committing unnatural sexual acts with men must be persecuted with the utmost severity because such vices will lead to the disintegration of the German people. It doesn't take much effort to find similar attempts to ostracize the LGBTQ community by conservative Americans. They passed 75 anti-LGBTQ bills in 2023 alone. Both in Germany and America, the campaigns against the LGBTQ community have been led by Christians. If you had a gay son or a gay daughter, what would you do? Well, it's not going to happen. If I did, I would have nothing to do with them. That's like saying, well, what if your daughter, you know, grew up to be an axe murderer? What if your son grew up to be like Adolf Hitler? As long as you bring up Adolf Hitler, he wanted to exterminate Jews and anyone who wasn't blonde hair and blue eyed, who didn't fit into his vision of the way people should be. Isn't that in a way what you're preaching, that you want to get rid of anyone who isn't heterosexual? I believe what the Bible says that homosexuals should be executed. Let me make myself clear. I believe that, and I've never gone back on that for one second. Anyone who is not heterosexual should die, correct? Absolutely, of course. That's what the Bible says. You, you hate gay people. Yes. The Nazi movement was predominantly Christian, and religion strongly influenced the draconian social policies. Godless communism and atheism were not welcome in the Nazi regime. Hitler would state, Without pledging ourselves to any particular confession, we have restored faith to its prerequisites because we were convinced that the people needs and requires this faith. We have therefore undertaken the fight against the atheistic movement, and that not merely with a few theoretical declarations, we have stamped it out. Republicans have enacted unconstitutional restrictions in seven states against atheists holding public office. They are Arkansas, Maryland, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. This parallels the Nazi exclusion of Jews from holding public office. The Nazis, and Hitler in particular, are glorified within right-wing circles. Moms for Liberty prints Hitler quotes on their pamphlets. Trump repeats Nazi talking points. And other Republicans openly worship Hitler. Senator Frank S. Nicely said on the Senate floor, 1910, Hitler decided to live on the streets for a while. So for two years, Hitler lived on the streets and practiced his oratory and his body language and how to connect with the masses, and then went on to lead a life that got him in the history book. So a lot of these people, it's not a dead end. They can come out of this, these homeless camps and have a productive life. For the Nazis to be on the left, it seems very strange to keep finding so many Nazi sympathizers on the right. I came here to speak on behalf of Donald Trump. I've never met the man, but I can tell that he has nothing but the best interests of this country at heart. Some of the things that he's saying are issues that we've been tackling for years now. We talk about globalism, we talk about America first. Uh, these sort of things, bringing back American jobs, these are things that, that he's hitting on. So it's, it's put a lot of our uh, nationalism sort of becoming mainstream. All we want is to change America back to what it was. We do want to see whites, you know, rise and have, have uh, uh, our own state here in this country. Yet Nazi sympathizers continue to gaslight their positions by claiming that the Nazis were left-wing extremists. 
There are two groups that attempt to obfuscate the political ideology of the genocidal maniacs, also known as Nazis. The group that is so cognitively challenged they struggle to perform basic operations, like identify an elephant and a snake, and the group that aligns themselves with Nazi ideology, but is too ashamed to publicly admit it. These groups are not mutually exclusive. There is no debate regarding where on the political spectrum the Nazis landed. The Nazis are, and always have been, a right-wing extremist party. If you have any questions about the validity of my statement, just ask the self-avowed Nazis who they align with politically. Are you a neo-Nazi? Do I embrace it? Um, I, I don't try to push it away. Well, you're wearing a swastika on your shirt. Exactly. And you've got swastika flags. Why the flags? Why the shirt? Why these hateful symbols in this town? I don't think they're hateful. I think it's an ideology that has been completely uh, misinterpreted since the Third Reich. Okay, now I've got to stop like, you. I, I'm a misinterpreted. <laughs> misinterpreted. Six million no, Jews no. were killed. You'll never There's sell me on that. Rural America spoke up when they elected Trump. We're staring down the barrel of a gun here in white America. There's still 193 million white Americans. Yes, the vast majority of them are in their 60s and 70s, will be in the ground in the next 20 years, and therefore we have the possibility of becoming a minority in our own country. A possibility. It sounds to me of becoming a minority in our like own country. Like you're afraid of being me. And being me, this is my country. Every neo Nazi organization in the United States and abroad identifies right wing nationalists. They all share anti immigrant, anti LGBTQ, and anti minority views. Most identify as Christian as well, although there are groups that embrace paganism. None of these views are in line with the political left. It is beyond question that the Nazi social ideology is politically right. Of course, I don't think that most right-wing Americans truly believe that the Nazis were left-wing extremists, especially the talking head pundits that propagate this false narrative. It's just a laughably bad exercise of stupidity devoid of historical facts they engage in to gaslight their own history. It is so incredibly ignorant. Their main point centers around the inclusion of socialist in the party name. It's widely established that the social policies of the Nazis were in line with right-wing ideologies, but it is the inclusion of socialists in their name that is used to conclude their economic policies were Marxist or socialist, and therefore the Nazis were left-wing. The Nazis rejected Marxism and socialism as defined by both the left and right, and never viewed themselves as a left-wing party. The German Workers' Party was already an established far-right organization before they adopted the inclusion of socialist into their name. Yet many gladly take this moniker at face value without examining the statements, the history, or the policies of the Nazis. The insistence that Nazis were on the left based on the party name exposes the right's hypocrisy and idiocy. Take the denials that Hitler was a Christian as an example. The right in America is predominantly Christian, and if you've ever had a discussion with a Christian about Hitler, they will point out that he was Christian in name only. You might be outraged at the question, what? Hitler? A Christian? If there's anyone who ever walked the face of the earth that was not a Christian, it's Adolf Hitler. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. In no way, shape, size, or form could Adolf Hitler be identified as a true Christian? So they reject the inclusion of a self-identifying label as proof that Hitler was a member of their group, but gladly accept that the term socialist in the Nazi party name identifies them as politically left. Does anyone actually think that North Korea is a democracy? Of course not. But this childlike reasoning is used to deflect from their hypocrisy. Their position of accepting or rejecting identification in both issues is built on an emotional response that looks to distance themselves from the Nazis. It is no surprise that racists want to distance themselves from their bigotry, but their hatred defines them, the same way Nazism is defined by their racist nationalism, which is what also defines the American right wing. Therefore. Not only is it accurate to label the Nazis as right-wing, it is accurate to label Republicans and their supporters as Nazis.